Good evening, everyone. So, my name is Benjamin, and before we get into this, a like, comment, and subscription would be greatly appreciated. And uh, today, I kind of want to talk a little bit about the anatomy of a court opinion, specifically with regards to the Supreme Court. And to use this, uh, to explain this, I'm going to use an opinion I wrote for a uh, mock Supreme Court. Because I think that's a good idea, and it's actually part of a mock government for a fellow small YouTuber. Because, hey, we all need something that we do for relaxation. And, yes, I know it is extremely unusual for a person to consider uh, relaxation to be writing court opinions, but here we are, somebody who actually enjoys doing the rigors of... <clears throat> analysis reading and uh, legal opining that are necessary. So this is actually a challenge uh, regarding a challenge to the colloquial, as I called it, a colloquially known bump stock ban. Uh, specifically that section that I just highlighted, right? So. A court opinion will typically be broken down into a section where the topic is introduced. And then they will explain the logic of following the law and the logic behind the challenges or the defenses or any arguments brought up during oral arguments or even maybe during a brief. And oral arguments are basically where the justices ask questions of uh, the plaintiff as well as the defense, you know, the complainant as well as the defendant and occasionally the administration because sometimes it's a person versus a state or a person versus a person and the administration has nothing to do with it. And then eventually there will be a conclusion or sometimes they'll insert an acknowledgement of counter arguments, which I've actually done here in this opinion. Um, I'm not gonna read it in specific, well, maybe actually I should. Um, so this case was titled Andrews v. Trump because Trump was the person who the bump stock ban was uh, originated under. And I basically said that the case originally brought before the court pertaining to the constitutionality per the Commerce Clause, specifically the Domestic Commerce Clause. That's actually a sentence fragment and I accidentally put it in. <laughs> um, I didn't edit properly, I didn't uh, rewrite properly. Um, or else I would have changed that to the case uh, for the court pertaining to the Constitution and Permanent Commerce Clause. Yeah, that's really difficult to phrase that into a way that can make a sentence or add clauses to make that a sentence. Um, I begin the next sentence with, quote, the Congress shall have power to regulate commerce, dot, 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 and among the several states, dot, 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 period, it is in the general, and I state, and that's an end quote, I said it is in the general opinion of the court that this argument is insufficient, as in general there is nothing right regarding the colloquially known bump stock ban that violates the domestic commerce clause as it truly does permit the regulation of goods and services traded within the several states. However, during oral arguments, other issues regarding the bump stock ban were discussed. Now, I intended this to mean, uh, where is that, the ban value is missing, uh, nothing, uh, as it truly regards or truly permits the regulation of goods and services traded within several states. Um, I had intended this to mean traded in an interstate manner. However, the wording can could probably be used more 
accurately describe both interstate and intrastate, as in within the state, between, say, a city and a a town or a village within the same state. So it can be used to describe both inter- and intrastate commerce, right? Um, These issues, while not part of the arguments brought before the court, still merit discussion and deliberation as to ignore them would be a shirking of our sworn duty to evaluate, protect, and uphold the Constitution of these states united. Uh, slightly archaic phrasing there, um, at least at the very end, these states united. Yeah, that's archaic, if anything, and I am prone to archaic phraseology. Um, I... I put that in because I felt it necessary to justify why I was bringing in other questions during the oral arguments phase and why I was questioning about things other than the Commerce Clause. And I stated that at the end of the introduction, to prevent further litigation, it is the opinion of a majority of the justices that the issues regarding the ban must be evaluated and discussed in order to settle the dispute without wasting the resources, time, and sanity of further administrations and courts. Uh, Again, maybe a bit too expansive and maybe a bit excessive, but I felt it was necessary to explain why I wanted to go as in-depth as I did. And actually, this is something that's common of real-life court opinions, is that they will sometimes justify their... Uh, logic of questioning in the uh, oral arguments phase or why they will bring in arguments that don't seem initially relevant because quite often a justice will bring in an argument or a discussion that is maybe outside of the original case. Um, it actually happens, and I acknowledge that further down when I get to my acknowledgement of counter arguments, or at least one or two counter arguments. I state that first, however, the Commerce Clause must be properly handled. The Commerce Clause, specifically the Domestic Commerce Clause, grants Congress the ability to regulate trade between the several states. Generally, this has been interpreted to mean that Congress has regulatory power over most matters. Um, This was the, I'm going to pause right here, Uh, this was generally viewed as the majority opinion of the fairly liberal court phase uh, from the FDR administration forward um, until about the Rehnquist court. Um, The Rehnquist court viewed a much more narrow uh, view of the Commerce Clause. It was brought up by the plaintiff, however. This might run afoul of the Tenth Amendment's provision stating, quote, powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved for the states respectively, or to the people, end quote. However, due to the ban being a regulation on commerce, and more directly to the trade of goods and ser- uh, comment of goods and services, Uh, I wanted to separate that to be more specific, uh, comma. The Tenth Amendment is irrelevant in this case. The view of recent courts, comma, such as the Rehnquist Court, has viewed that any prohibition of activities under the Commerce Clause requires... Uh, the activity or good or service to be of obvious economic activity. Um, This is taking a very narrow view of the Commerce Clause, meaning that you actually have to deal with the exchange of goods and services in order for the Commerce Clause to be relevant in regulatory power. And as an originalist take, I kind of agree. Now, I admit I do have a an originalist or specifically original intent view of the Constitution of the United States. In addition, I also tend, 
while I do view original intent, which is a very small portion of originalists, admittedly, I will bring in arguments from textualists and people who favor the idea of original meaning, which is basically the concept that the Constitution should mean what the average person, you know, the normal person, at the era that particular clause, phrase, or language was adopted, or amendment was adopted, would interpret that to mean. I will occasionally bring that in. But I tend to focus on the idea of original intent because I don't actually think it's that difficult to determine what the founders intended the Constitution to be. They intended it to be stronger than the Articles of Confederation, but not so strong that it allowed a massive bureaucratic, regulatory, delegatory, and destructive menace on individual liberty that the modern that the constitution under a living constitutionalist perspective could be construed to allow anyway i'm going to continue uh while once possessed a bump stock or similar device is not used for any obvious economic activity the fact it had to have been traded for renders its existence as an economic activity and subject to congressional power to regulate, even if through a regulatory executive body, as those have been created as a means of Congress delegating its authority in order to more efficiently make and manage laws and legislation. Uh, this is a very long sentence. Uh, I don't actually know how many words it is, but that is a very, very, very long sentence, and I apologize for including it. It is, as far as I can tell, grammatically correct, even if excessively long. <laughs> and I actually got a lot of complaints from uh, university professors that I tended to have excessively... Uh, elaborate sentence structures. So, the reason why I explain this is because the Commerce Clause does regulate interstate and uh, most people would agree intrastate commerce. And because most people lack the capability to make a bump stock or similar device uh, by themselves, the vast majority of people are going to have to trade for it or you know, perform an economic activity in order to attain one. And therefore, I consider its existence in the hands of a private person to be subject to regulatory power under Congress and any delegatory ba uh, bodies. Uh, even if I personally disagree with the ban, I do understand that there is a logical argument to state that it can be subject to Commerce Clause powers of Congress in order to regulate or ban. So during oral arguments, I ask questions about the Fifth Amendment. Uh, I'll explain the next part because it's very quick to reach that. And any other potential arguments that might come up in order to defend it. So I stated the issues with the ban come in a few areas. First, and most concerning, is the flaunting of norms established in Article 1, Section 9, Clause 3, which states, No bill of attainder or ex post facto law shall be passed. End quote. Uh, the issue is that the law rendered the possession of a bump stock illegal through the redefining of the definition for legal purposes under the National Firearms Act, 1934, to be classed as a machine gun and rendered illegal per the Hughes Amendment of the Firearm Owners Protection Act, 1986. By the, um, so I was basically explaining that the 
ban was a redefining of what a bump stock is. Prior to 2018, a bump stock was classed as a non-firearm and therefore subject to no firearms regulation whatsoever. However, after 2018, the ATF decided to determine bump stocks were machine guns. And I explain why this becomes a problem later on in the opinion. <clears throat> By declaring bump stocks to be machine guns, the ATF rendered all bump stocks illegal for possession by the general population, save for those with the proper licenses, such as a manufacturer's federal firearms license. Um, also, this can include a dealer's federal firearms license, as well as one or two other ways to attain a machine gun that was manufactured after May 19th, 1986. Uh, this is because bump stocks were invented after 1986, and thus none were in existence when the NFA registry was closed for machine guns. Now, this was the Hughes Amendment to the Firearm Owners Protection Act. It closed the machine gun registry part of the National Firearms Act, um, and which is problematic if you want to change the legal definition of a device to be a machine gun rather than what it was previously. It constitutes uh, legalese bullshit, for lack of a better term, where you're making up a change in the, regul uh, change in the definition or in order to achieve a goal that you wanted. Immediately, this required those who possessed the devices to relieve themselves of their property through either destruction or surrender to the ATF or other authorized authorities. As there is no grace period or temporary reopening of the registry, for, uh, the registry, those who were in possession of previously legal devices found themselves potentially committing felony violations of the law. Um, actually, there should be a comma right here, but my grammar is almost never perfect. Um, it is the majority opinion of the court that this constitutes passing of an ex post facto law, and that alone would be sufficient to strike down the bump stock ban. Now, an ex post facto, which is what these two sentences cover, is the idea of a law that would criminalize and allow the prosecution of crimes committed before the illegality of a new law. So let's say you had a law that would ban the manufacture of alcohol or a constitutional amendment that would ban the production of alcohol and you decided to punish brewers who were in operation before the passage of that law or amendment. Well, this would be uh, a verboten, to borrow a German word. Uh, because of uh, Article 1, Section 9, Clause 3's prohibition of an ex post facto. Because it would be punishing you after you've already committed what is now a crime, but what was not a crime when you committed it. And if you need to know why an ex post facto is bad, I really shouldn't have to explain it. But an ex post facto is a terrible idea to pass a law based off of because all of a sudden you, run, you, allow, you allow the prosecution of people who did nothing wrong, at least in the eyes of the law, when they did the act to be prosecuted under a new law. It'd be like saying, we're going to make profanity illegal and punish anybody who has ever uttered a profanity. Obviously, that would be wrong on more than just ex post facto reasons, but for solely ex post facto reasons, it would be hor horrifically wrong. But I structured that because I believe that that is the strongest argument, so I want it to be the first argument that comes up.
Now, I've stated using the third person because I believed it was most effective in separating my own personal opinion from any concurring justices. I say this justice also notes the vagueness of the ban, as the reclassification stated that any device that could allow a semi-automatic firearm to be discharged in a manner simulating fully automatic, automatic fire would be classed as a machine as machine guns. Leaves open the issues of the ingenuity of the American people. Basically, I said. The law is really vague to the point of meaninglessness. It is not unknown for people to simulate the effect of a bump stock with common household goods, comma, their belt loops, comma, or even simply their own strengths. Now I made sure to use an Oxford comma here because you can use common household goods such as laundry rags or clothes lines or curtain hangers to simulate the effect of a bump stock if you know what you're doing. Uh, I've seen people on YouTube record using their belt loops to effectively create a bump stock. And there are videos of people shoulder firing an M1 Garand in a manner that would simulate the effect of fully automatic fire, thus rendering their own strength, you know, their own body as a bump stock. Thus, I thought it was excessively vague, the ban, and therefore, I'll explain later why I think it was, that would render it unconstitutional in and of itself. I stated it would seem, necess uh, it would seem needlessly silly to apply the ban fully by its own definition to make belt loops illegal simply because clever people have found a way to use them to simulate automatic fire from a semi-automatic firearm. Much like if one were to arrest a person for violating the National Firearms Act for accidentally spilling a few common household cleaning chemicals together for the manufacture of a destructive device. It is also here the court must state that vague laws render the law ineffectual and even unconstitutional. Um, the reason why I mentioned this and stated the previous few lines is that if a law is too vague, it can be interpreted too broadly and the more broadly you interpret a law the more unconstitutional it becomes and in this case if you were to apply the change in definition based solely on what the ATF defined as a change in definition fully you would have to arrest literally every citizen of the United States because your body can be used to simulate automatic fire from a semi-automatic weapon. And it's easily available on YouTube for how to do this. And I felt this was also a very strong argument, so that's why I put it here right after what I felt was the strongest argument because I felt this was sufficiently strong enough to warrant its placement well within but high enough to get to garner attention and a lot of justices will do this will take it from the most prescient the most effectual and the most important part of the opinion and then work down now I haven't stated what my verdict is because I believe that is perfect for a conclusion because a conclusion should conclude the argument you shouldn't state right off the bat because I think if you state right off the bat well who cares about what your arguments for it are you're just stating it right off the bat so people can read it and then say done I don't need to worry about why and the problem is we as a society don't ask why enough I try and finish this as quickly as possible. I stated other issues with the ban arise when we examine the consequences of the ban, starting with the Fifth Amendment, specifically the section that states, quote, 
nor shall private property be taken for the public use without just compensation, period, end quote. Uh, this justice, again, separating myself from any concurring justices, understands that public safety fits the definition of public use. And thus, when private property is secured by the United States, the owner must receive just compensation. And there were no provisions in the ban to do so, thus running afoul of the provisions set forth in one of our most respected amendments. Um, I think that's fairly self-explanatory. And the reason I put that there is it is actually a very good conclusion for the arguments promoting my argument and my idea regarding the logic of where I'm coming from. Because if you're going to start with arguing that the Commerce Clause doesn't really matter in a case regarding where the primary argument in favor was the Commerce Clause, you need to finish with a very strong argument in favor of your logic. So I felt that was good. Now I begin the acknowledgement of contrary arguments. And I say, some will argue, however, that this law was necessary and proper for the nation, and therefore Congress and its delegatory bodies have jurisdiction and regulatory power. Again, with the other issues from a constitutionality standpoint, this is irrelevant. However, this is not an argument unworthy of consideration. Now I'm going to pause here. The reason why I believe that the necessary and proper clause is irrelevant is outlined further. And oftentimes the necessary and proper clause, sometimes called the elastic clause, the reason why I believe it is irrelevant in this case is outlined below, and it's because I believe the Necessary and Proper Clause has been over-interpreted and is overly expansive towards congressional power. Now, I didn't intend to narrow it as much as I did in this opinion. Um, <laughs> I, I, may be o I maybe overdid it, but I personally believe that my wording was necessary to explain the choice of logic in this case and was necessary for the interpretation I had gone for, which was more of an original intent and original meaning. So, I said, however, comma, this is not an argument unworthy of consideration. Indeed, comma, Congress does, quote, have power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers, comma, and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States, comma, or in any department or officer thereof, end quote. The issue is that this clause refers to the passing of laws focused on improving the ability to execute existing law in the United States, and that those laws must still also or must also still comply with other provisions in the Constitution and in the Bill of Rights. Um, and this is where I state that I maybe overdid the narrowing of the Necessary and Proper Clause. But the way I understand the Necessary and Proper Clause is it states to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. And, of course, the rest. The clause that states for carrying into execution the foregoing powers is the part that I focused on because I noticed, wait a second, people have said that it's necessary and proper to do this, that, the other thing, but the necessary and proper clause doesn't state shall 
have the power to make all laws which are necessary and proper, period, which is a very subjective argument. It says it says that it needs to be in ex- in able to execute the law further or to be able to properly execute the law. And that part has caught my mind since when I first read the Constitution. And it is extremely limiting to interpret it the way I have, or the way I've read it, or to even not ignore the second part, you know, for carrying into execution the foregoing powers, for somebody who favors a living uh, constitution interpretation. The reason why I had to include this was because, well, if I ignore this argument completely, people are going to say, well, you just ignored the elastic clause or you ignored the necessary and proper clause and use it to discredit the opinion because I ignored a potential counter-argument. I didn't. I wanted to explain the counter-argument in this section right before the cons- uh, the conclusion. I wanted to explain why I didn't think that a counter-argument was sufficiently strong. And that's why I did this. I admit my wording was a bit clumsy here, but it is what it is. I did justify it with an allusion or a reference to a founder. I stated, if this clause were to be taken to mean Congress had the power to pass any law it deemed necessary at the time of passing, or any delegatory body to dictate at any opportunity, as Patrick Henry argued during the Virginia Ratifying Convention, the clause would lead to limitless federal power and would lead to an inevitable menace on individual liberty. If this clause were taken to mean Congress could indeed violate other clauses and sections of the Constitution along with their delegatory bodies, the Congress could indeed determine law without regard to uh, for the rights of the people. Basically, that is a very originalist take on the necessary and proper clause as well as federal authority within the Commerce Clause and other sections of the Constitution. Because originalists tend to argue on the side of the anti-federalists that are very skeptical of the federal power granted by the Constitution, especially certain clauses such as the Necessary and Proper Clause, as well as the overexpansive view of the Commerce Clause. So that is why I felt it there. I also felt that it, a section arguing why also considered additional arguments was necessary and to include it here. I said the court does also recognize, and especially this justice, the issues concerning evaluation of a law and a legal challenge of that law from a point other than the argument brought forth in the challenge, as it could be seen as legislating from the bench, a.k.a. judicial activism. Uh, This justice, however, finds this to be a dubious claim at best and will cite as precedent for the decision to bring in other arguments in order to properly evaluate the law the cases of Marbury v. Madison, where the constitutionality of the Judiciary Act was not even on the docket as the case was merely a civil suit pursued under original jurisdiction However, the court found they did not have jurisdiction under the Constitution contrary to the Judiciary Act, semicolon, and the case United States v. Miller, where the National Firearms Act was evaluated under the Second Amendment, but the act was upheld under the Commerce Clause with some arguments under the Second Amendment used to justify the regulatory power of Congress with regards to the taxation of the arms in question. Thus, it is not out of the ordinary for the court to examine all potential arguments when reviewing a case in order to ensure the best possible ruling. Uh, Basically here, I wanted to explain that some questions brought up during the deliberation phase between myself and the fellow justices 
um, regarding why I'm not just solely focusing on the Commerce Clause argument, e despite my agreement that the bump stock ban falls perfectly within the powers of the Commerce Clause, of the government within the Commerce Clause, why I'm arguing against the bump stock ban by bringing in other arguments that were not even brought up during oral arguments, or at least not in the original uh, briefing uh, requesting a writ of certiorari. And I felt it necessary to explain that, believe it or not, uh, the Supreme Court is often brought in or questioned from other directions, cases brought before the court, regardless of what was... Um, discussed during the permission for a writ of search of your eye, as well as during oral arguments. Because, well, let's be honest, justices are people. Sometimes they want to bring in other arguments. They want to discuss other things during a case that may not seem immediately relevant. So basically, I wanted to explain myself there. And oftentimes a justice, if they uh, want to discuss something further. We'll put that ahead, but I decided to put that there as a reasonable conclusion for the argument phase of the opinion. And this is actually a relatively short opinion given uh, what is normal for the Supreme Court. I say that in conclusion, of course, I didn't include that phrasing, but I said, it is therefore in the majority opinion of the court that the colloquially known bump stock ban be stricken as a textbook example of an ex post facto law and for its violation of the Fifth Amendment's protection against the uncompensated seizing of property via the Fourteenth Amendment's due process clause. And of course I signed myself and any justice who wanted to agree with me signed on below. The others wrote concurrences. Or didn't. They just assented to the opinion. Uh, basically, the conclusion is fairly short and sweet and s a summary of what had been explained in the previous uh, authoring. And I typically like putting the definite conclusion last because when you put a definite conclusion last, it makes people understand, okay, it's over, you can turn over to something else more interesting now. Anyway, I just looked at the clock on my explanation of how a judicial argument is laid out, as well as an example and a thorough reading and analysis and uh, author's commentary on it. And I realized I'm at 38 minutes, so I'm going to go ahead and end it here. Uh, thank you very much for watching, if you actually made it through to the end of this. Um, take it very easy. Um, this was for a uh, mock Supreme Court on... An, another smaller YouTuber's channel, or, you know, more accurately, his online following, uh, that's God of Politics. Uh, I'll include a link to his YouTube channel in the description because it's necessary, and he's a very good person. Um, take it very easy, everybody. Uh, have a very lovely evening, and I'll see you all on Wednesday. Bye-bye.